It's no wonder that the wave of disgust has washed over the population in the past two years, but this otherwise natural response has become alienating, swollen like an ulcer ready to burst and wash away its arbitrary target in a wave of pus. A swamp full of squirming worms festering underneath the surface has finally perforated it and is now slowly oozing out, devouring all, including worms, just like itself. And conveniently enough, all that under the veil of safety and protection. Has this description evoked disgust in you? If so, you'll understand how easy it is to connect a concept seemingly unrelated to disgust itself and turn it into an object of rage, avoidance or outright hate. Research has shown that disgust can be evoked by suggestion in a relatively easy fashion, which makes it an ideal tool for control and manipulation. Philosopher and moral psychology researcher Daniel Kelly writes, There need not be any perceivable physical residue left by the source entity on the contaminated receiving entity in order for an agent to find and continue to consider the receiving entity disgusting. Once considered contaminated, an entity is then treated as disgusting and thus elicits all the features of the disgust response. Hitler clumped up what formed his personal swamp, took the antagonist image that stood in the way of his ideal of racial purity and turned it into visceral disgust with Jews. He simultaneously merged the visual representation of disease with a concrete group and thus beguiled the masses to follow. They adopted the same image, oblivious to its underlying basis. All they saw was disease just as intended. Normally, the representation of disease arises from the association with past experiences, hence the avoidance of anything that resembles it, such as slimy surfaces. But given that we have memory to be able to apply the learned onto new things and settings, the ingrained representations may also be misapplied. And so, under the veil of health preservation, a massive schism between individuals was built out of a simple misalignment. The concept of branched individuality disappeared underneath the dual projection of the pure and the impure set over it, with the state becoming the ultimate ideal of purity, the only saviour, with its sword called unquestionable rules. And the foundation of it all was glued together by one simple emotion, disgust. Disgust is an evolutionary adaptation, a protective mechanism evolved to heighten the chance of survival in a potentially harmful environment. It activates a set of physiological and behavioural responses meant to drive hygienic behaviour and lead to avoidance of objects that could possibly lead to contagion of disease. When activated, physical contact or proximity is avoided and distance is sought from the objects in question. These may include rotten food, bad smells, slimy surfaces, or even circular patterns that resemble symptoms of a disease, which also relates to trypophobia, or fear of holes, and importantly, it also includes false positives, such as rubber vomit. However, physical presence of a possible pathogen is not the sole requirement for activation of disgust. Research shows that real and imaginative disgust have, in fact, the same effect. To evoke the feelings and visions that accompany disgust is the role of the behavioural immune system. Its goal is to identify barren behaviour associated with a disease. However, in its pathological form, disgust can pervade the imagination to such an extent that disease may be seen everywhere, even where there is none. It may become associated with otherwise benign objects or places, and all the what-ifs will become a hindrance, an obsession. This can be specifically observed, for example, in patients with obsessive-compulsive disorder, in which the compulsion arises from the desire for self-preservation, which is the purpose of disgust, only that it's present when it shouldn't be. Psychological revulsion against a specific outer phenomenon may arise as a result of a failure to integrate the shadow, the dark, repressed aspect of the psyche. 
In the process of individuation, the shadow must be faced, which tends to lead to self-disgust. Self-disgust is also implied in a number of conditions, from depression to eating disorders. If the shadow overtakes the personality, it seems to the ego that there is no other way to protect itself than to project the shadow outside. This may of course lead to a need for extermination of the object on which it ends up being projected. The disease or what is perceived to be the disease and the object are merged. Instead of eliminating the disease or source of filthiness alone, the object entire is eliminated. Hitler was a germaphobe strongly afflicted by projection. This is very clear in his usage of specific vocabulary, which was teeming with terms such as disease, parasite, pestilence or plague. Another more physical example of this would be that the same poison that was used to kill rats, Zyklon B, was used in gas chambers. The object of elimination merged with the definition of pest, its individuality forgotten. Thus, mass persecution of the groups perceived as unclean was properly justified. Ironically, to escape his fear of disgust, Hitler engaged in the most disgusting activities imaginable. This is the trick shadow plays on the ego when it becomes overshadowed by it. Feeling of disgust causes a drop in temperature and heart rate deceleration. It increases salivation and gastrointestinal activity. The avoidance reflex is caused by the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which plays an inhibitory role in behaviour control. Possibly, this could lead to inaction, or even a sort of mental paralysis when the object of disgust is being eliminated, regardless of the possible immorality of the action. The conviction of the singularity of the external object of disgust and the source of internal disgust act as a veil over either reason or values. The interaction between the mental visualization and physical experience makes disgust particularly dangerous. Dehumanization of the object of fear is perhaps the direst consequence of disgust. Jews were reduced to parasites, therefore there was no reason not to exterminate them. The unvaccinated, the unmasked, or even anyone is now seen as a potential source of viral spread, or in other words, a source of possible contamination and therefore endangerment. This again reduces the individual to an exterminable hindrance, if not yet consciously, then certainly unconsciously. That's more than clear from the general enmity and introduction of policies that aim to separate. Thus, the individual ceases to exist. There is just a dehumanized object of disgust. And the possible directions this can take are plenty. An image of an organism parasiting on the society can be imprinted on a person or a group. Dehumanization is the lever that ushers in all the sewage that's been slowly festering underneath. After that comes the next stage. The state comes in and convinces the population that this group must be exterminated for their protection. And they will agree because they've been convinced that this group or individual is a pathogen that must be eliminated lest they spread their disease. After all, self-preservation comes before reason when an immediate threat is identified, regardless of whether the identification was correct or not. The individual and collective interests thus merge. The desire to preserve racial purity of the Aryan race, an abstract ideal, led to visceral disgust with all that diverged from it. That overtook empathy, the ability to appreciate other people's mind, which is lost en masse under the outer characteristics that are the only ones perceived. All it then takes is for a charismatic leader to step in, purport the ideas already adopted by the population and act on their behalf. In this fashion, a group can become perceived as a public threat. As such, no one will oppose coercion if it's capable of elimination of the threat. Our society is built on beliefs and both danger and success lie in their malleability.
Unfortunately, all it takes for the public opinion to change is a subtle change of the narrative in the direction aligned with the common beliefs. Pervasiveness, propaganda and specific vocabulary along with a seemingly successful, alluring alternative that promises to eliminate the unpleasant and provide the pleasant was all it took to convince the public, whether we talk about Germany or Soviet Russia. And bear in mind that these tools are still being utilised today by the government and advertisement. Uh, so, 62 at that time million people in UK, 40 deaths a day, I worked it out for Belgium. That would be seven deaths a day at the peak of the epidemic. I used that in the media. That is true in every year, even interpandemically. <laughs> Talking about fatalities is important because when you say that, people say, wow, what do you mean? People die because of influenza? And that was a necessary step to, uh, to take. And then I misused the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the top, top football soccer clubs in Belgium um, inappropriately uh, and against all uh, agreements vaccinated their, uh, they made their soccer players priority people. So I said, I can use that. Because if the, the population really believes that this, this vaccine is so desirable that even the soccer players would be dishonest to get their vaccine, uh, I, I said, okay, I can, I can play with that. So I made a big fuss about it. Funnily enough, I have even stumbled upon some social psychologists using terms like quote-unquote psychological inoculation in relation to fake news. In their words, people should be exposed to small doses of misinformation to reduce their susceptibility to the so-called fake news. The seemingly benign idea, of course, portrays any other source of information than the official one as a source of disease and subjects the patient to the doctor, the state. By now, I believe you have a clear idea of how disgust works, but you may still ask, why can't people see how irrational it is to persecute an object or a group out of imagined disgust? Here, we have to delve deeper into what gave rise to the collective image of the group psyche. The majority behaved as one in the extermination of Jews, sometimes even under a strong self-willed denial of reality. There were various reasons, but what we'll look at here will be discussed. I would argue that people wanted to persecute Jews out of their self-loathing. People sought an ideal of purity out of their own insufficiency. Fed by a charismatic leader who took on the role of God the Father, the fantasy further inflated and people became identified with it. They became the children made in the image of this God and they themselves believed it. Inflation mixed with regression to infantilism. To protect it naturally, they must have invented an object of loathing and disgust, an antagonist and this was provided by the Father. This is what befell Jews. Out of their own inadequacy, individuals clung to a perfect image that had to be protected at all costs out of self-preservation. Hence the importance of the role of disgust. In a way, the ego is thus split in half. The dominant half, that wishes to become its own ideal, takes over. The other half is the one that contains values in conflict with the desired ideal, and so it must be repressed. Freud explained it brilliantly in one sentence only. A man, when he cannot be satisfied with his ego itself, may nevertheless be able to find satisfaction in the ego ideal, which has been differentiated out of the ego. Another point is that people always need an enemy to fight against. Ideally, it would be their own vices. But since that's sometimes difficult to realise consciously or too hard to face, These are projected outside and create an outer enemy, which embodies them. An enemy is, of course, an enemy because it's loathed or at least antagonized in some way, and it only becomes seen as enemy when the hero believes it attempts to take away something precious from him. What happened in the 20th century is the largest and most astonishing proof we have so far that we live inside narratives, and that even the most preposterous fantasy or far-fetched fairy tale can be turned into reality. And what's even more incredible 
is that it's put in motion by a mere emotion.